Good evening and welcome to our OTF Connect session, Making with Minecraft tonight with Brian Aspinall. Uh, just before we introduce Brian and get him started, I'd like to introduce Syria from OTF. She's a facilitator and administrator of the OTF Connects program. Yay, Syria, which is uh, alive and well in the province right now, and many, many teachers taking advantage of it. She's going to uh, join us and do a little welcome. So welcome, Syria. And thank you very much, Susan. And I'd like to welcome Susan um, as uh, our part of our new moderating uh, team this year. So welcome, Susan and Mally, tonight. Uh, we're very lucky we have two moderators to help out Brian tonight. Hello, everyone, and welcome to OTF Connect. I am absolutely delighted with the rich program that we have scheduled uh, for you for this winter spring program. Um, and happy to let you know that uh, there's going to be quite a number of new webinars that are going to be posted probably later this week and certainly by early next week. And many of them will be supporting teachers in the area of mathematics. So do check the calendar frequently. Um, I'd really like to thank each and every one of you for giving of your own time to join us tonight. It's so wonderful to have representation clear across the province and from the far north. It's wonderful and always great to have new participants uh, joining the group. Um, since we've got a really large group, I want to make this announcement now so that you don't miss it at the end. Um, I, when, you exit the, when you exit the session tonight, uh, you will get a link uh, to give us a survey, uh, to fill in a, a survey, a feedback survey. and. Um, the feedback is so very important. We read them over, and we um, we really value uh, what you have to say to us. Over the last couple of years, people have been asking for certificates. So I'd like to announce that this year, um, you will be receiving a certificate of participation, with which you will be able to create for yourself once you fill in the survey and submit it. So please um, make sure you take the time at the end of the session tonight to do that. It's now my absolute pleasure to welcome Brian Aspinall, who will be facilitating tonight's webinar, Making the a Minecraft. Brian, um, he's a very knowledgeable and passionate educator. He brings uh, so many creative and useful strategies um, to share with you tonight. He, um, I love the way he makes the, all the curriculum connections. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, Brian, I'll pass the mic over to you. Thank you very much, Syria. Uh, hello, world. My name is Brian Aspinall, and uh, just going through the chat box there, I noticed there's some uh, volume issues. So let's try the poll already. If my volume is OK, can you give me a green check mark? If my volume is a little bit too quiet, give me a red X. Oh, boy. Maybe I'm too loud couple of questions already. That's OK. Robin and Matt, if you would like to uh, quickly type before we get started, let's make sure everything is resolved. OK, great. So OK, perfect. So my sound is OK. All right. Uh, so my name is Brian Aspinall. Um, I am an intermediate teacher in beautiful Chatham, Ontario with the Lambton Kent District School Board. Uh, this year I teach a grade 7 and 8 split class. Uh, we're, doing something, we're trying something new in our program, so we have four grade 7 and 8 split classes. And then we split our splits and we teach rotary math. So I team teach grade 7 math to 57 students, and my other two colleagues uh, team teach grade 8 math to our 40 ish grade 8 students. If you'd like to um, you know, see my work, I'm going to include QR codes and my web address on most of my slides. If you'd like to reach out and ask questions at any time um, after the fact, by all means, please do so. Because I have included the QR codes, um, I guess I was wondering, I, I'm, it looks like most people are on a computer of sorts. If you have a mobile device handy, and you have a QR code scanner. Uh, I use one called Enigma that I just threw into the chat box. This way, uh, if you'd like to you know, watch some of the videos that I have here, 
on your mobile device. It just seems to be a little bit more fluid um, and easier to do. You, you, of course, can watch them on your computer as well, but it might be an interesting way to, or a neat way to, to collect these resources. So uh, before we begin, uh, because the mics are muted, I'm going to talk to myself and my dog who's in the room for the next hour and a half. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind, I'm just curious as to whether we are elementary, whether we are secondary, whether we are a mix, uh, and, and more specifically, what divisions. So if you could spend the next 30 seconds just quickly typing into the chat box uh, who you are and, and what grades you teach and if there's anything unique um, in, in your subject area, I'd love to know that as well. I do like to mute my microphone every once in a while, so don't think that you've lost sound. <laughs> Usually I'm just taking a breath and I don't want to blow into the microphone. It looks like we have mostly elementary, and it looks like we might be predominantly primary. There's an adult ed. Hi, Christy. Well, some intermediate there, too. Okay, great. Okay. I wasn't sure. Uh, sometimes it can be a mix. As, as We have secondary folk, of course, who are certainly interested in integrating Minecraft into their um, lessons as well. So. Before I jump into Minecraft, I want to talk a little bit about computational thinking. Computational thinking is a term uh, first defined by Seymour Papert in the 70s and early 80s, and has since come around again since uh, Jeanette Wing from Microsoft has been researching it a little bit further. And the idea with computational thinking is that it's, it's a required skill for the future in that kids are going to be solving authentic problems using tools and devices available to them. And as such, they're going to be able to solve problems that they couldn't do prior without these tools. And so integrating these tools into our lessons and having kids think about the technology and how they can use the technology in order to create solutions to, to rich, open-ended problems is incredibly crucial. Um, the QR code there will take you to Jeanette Wing's research from uh, 2006 or 2007 where she talks a lot about coding uh, and computer science, but she does make it very clear that computational thinking is for everybody, not just the coder. It's, it's a skill that our, you know, our future generations will need to, to embrace. It's the, what I call the critical thinking plus the power of the computer. So computational thinking is sort of the big, big umbrella, if you will, and, and coding is a piece of that. Building things in Minecraft is definitely a piece of that. Crunching numbers and making graphs and organizing data is certainly a form of computational thinking. You know, using a green screen, um, making videos that way, all, all forms of computational thinking. And yes, Lisa, the computational thinking contest is new this year, I believe. Give me a thumbs up if that's true. Certainly something I'm uh, very excited to check out. Um, I think we're moving in the right direction. There's computational thinking is being taught in many of our faculties of education now. Um, so it, it will be, it will be um, you know, rampant to that next generation of teachers as well. Uh, I'm curious though, computational thinking, how do, we, how do we look at it in terms of assessment? I mean, we, we have thinking in all of our rubrics. Thinking is always a category. And, and combining the ability to think and solve problems using the power of the computer, I really love to use anecdotal evidence to focus on the learning skills. I think that's one area that I'm really passionate about. You know, you can look at the front page of an elementary report card, and if you see E's and G's, you really don't have to open it to see A's and B's. There just seems to be this correlation. And so there's a lot of discussion at our school. You know, if a student has S and N's on the first page, odds are uh, we're looking at C's and D's on the inside. And so if we reshift our focus and focus solely on soft skills, you know, maybe little Johnny's math mark will improve if we work on his organization. Maybe there's a direct correlation there. So we fit our, our computational thinking strategies at our school we're trying to fit them into the learning skills under this mindset to, to see if we can sort of improve the, the grade piece through the 21st century skills that we keep talking about in education. 
And of course, you know, the six C's, Michael Fulon's work that um, is, is very fluent uh, throughout Ontario. Actually, our school board has created an engagement model that sort of follows the six C's and the four P's that MIT has put out, passion, play, uh, peers, and projects are the four P's that uh, MIT uses when they're talking about the scratch environment for coding. So before I go in too deep, I would like to know what your experience is. So if you would hit the clip art button and choose the common symbols again, uh, I'm going to grab a smiley face and I'm going to plunk myself over to the right. Where do you fit? And, you know, I've heard of Minecraft or I've seen Minecraft. That might mean that you have kids who play with it or you have students in your class who, who play with it and you've, you've seen it over a shoulder. Um, you know, if you've just heard of Minecraft but you've never really explored it, throw yourself on the left. And, of course, if, if you've tried Minecraft on the right, then you could probably <laughs> run this webinar just as well as I could. You know, full disclosure here, I... I have certainly tried Minecraft. Uh, I don't have a tremendous amount of experience with it. But I've learned in, in, in my career that the big shift in pedagogy for me was to understand what these tools are capable of doing and to not try and be an expert in all of them because you'll just wear yourself so thin. So uh, I've, I've played with Minecraft. I know what it's capable of doing, and that's enough for me to in, incorporate it into my lessons and really engage you know, more often than not, the disengaged students. I just, I'm going to pause every once in a while. I, I ramble on and I, I disregard the chat box. So I just want to quickly go through with that. Focusing on the 60s, I uh, really like that we're using the why. Yeah, there was a time in my career, Lisa, where I used apps and tools because they were incredibly engaging. And I knew I was using them for the right reasons but I really didn't know why. And there was a time in my career, of course, where I didn't know the curriculum as much as I do now. I knew I was doing really good things with coding, but I didn't truly understand why I was doing those things and what I was really looking for in terms of assessment um, and evaluation. So I hope tonight we can explore not just what Minecraft you know, is capable of, but also how to incorporate it um, and how to make our students think, you know, the computational thinking piece and also go a little bit richer and deeper using lessons that we already, we already have today. So what is Minecraft? It seems like many of us are new to it, so we're going to do a little bit of shared reading. Minecraft is a game about breaking and placing blocks. At first, people build structures to protect against nocturnal monsters. But as the game grew, players worked together to create wonderful, imaginative things. It can also be about adventuring with friends or watching the sunrise over a blocky ocean. It's pretty. Brave players battle ter terrible things in the nether, which is more scary than pretty. You can also visit the land of mushrooms if it sounds more like your cup of tea. When people ask me what Minecraft is, I describe it as an infinite Lego with the same size blocks. So you've, students have, uh, they're called maps, or, or I call them a canvas, if you will, and they have different kind of textured blocks that allows them to create structures um, in the sky, uh, on the ground, in caves, underground. They can hide things, they can, they can build castles, they can build caves. But it all comes back to the fact that they're using um, blocks, and the blocks are, are mathematically by default. Each Minecraft block is one cubic meter, and I'll touch a little bit more on that uh, in the next couple of slides. What's important to know about Minecraft is it really is close to seven years old now, which means that many of our students don't even know a world without Minecraft. We talk about our students being digital natives uh, and not knowing a world without Google, in about, you know, two or three years' time, all of our elementary students will not know a world without Minecraft. So in June 2001, Marcus Person quits his job as an established games developer to create his own game. And I, I think it's important to talk about the history here because this individual took a risk and he used his own computational thinking skills to create this new, what he called a game, 
back in 2009. I mean, we keep talking about risk taking um, and, and trial and error and modeling the problem solving process in our classroom. The individual that started Minecraft did just that authentically. He was unemployed but enthusiastic. Marcus was looking for inspiration and came up, and it came from an indie game development blog called TigSource. Though Marcus's original idea wasn't as fully featured as the Minecraft you'll play today, Cave Game was created from the same DNA. This was a game about placing and breaking blocks in a 3D world. The primary motivation was to create an experience where each individual component felt fun, a game that could be both accessible and emergent. And then what I would like for you to do now, I'd just love to pay homage to the original idea, the first screenshot that Marcus ever took, the first screen capture he ever took of his original game is still on YouTube. So let's spend five minutes. I believe the video is about three and a half minutes long. Um, if you would watch the video, there's no sound. When you come back, if you could let us know that you've completed the video by hitting the green check mark, we're going to stay on this slide, on this page, until um, everybody has had a chance to just explore the original Minecraft and what that idea looked like uh, back in 2009. So I'm going to mute my microphone. Don't think that your audio has gone away. I'm just going to mute it and take a breath, and I'm going to head over to YouTube. Okay, we're still waiting for a few. I've seen that video a few times now, and, and I always notice a different math um, math vocabulary come through each time. He was talking about infinite grass. Uh, he was talking about the dimensions of the of the blocks, and, and this was his you know original idea that he's turned into something incredibly phenomenal. That's almost in you know every household that that has children and and devices. And uh, the green check is the fourth icon under your name. Um, if you just hover over it, you will see the green yes or the red X no there. So we're at 37 out of 48. Uh, Christine, no, there was no volume in that video. I was just referring to the explanations in the video. Um, Marcus, when he was creating that that video, because there was no volume, he was sort of writing down some of the explanations, um, you know, in the video as kind of sticky notes, I guess. And there's a few math math words that jumped out at me, and I just think about how he used mathematics uh, to create what he what we now know as Minecraft, called the original cave game uh, back then. Okay, we're at 42, 43 out of 48, and I know that some people uh, have said they're finished in the, in the chat box, so I'm going to continue. So Cave Game blew up. Uh, it went viral, and I'm glad that it did, because Microsoft caught wind, of course, and in 2004, Microsoft purchased the, the company uh, for $2.5 billion. And for us as educators, I personally think that's probably the best thing that could have ever happened to not only Marcus, but to us, because Minecraft and Microsoft are now working on this community to create and develop resources 
for teachers to use Minecraft as a teaching tool. And I'll touch upon that a little bit later in the slides. But, you know, if, if this hadn't happened, I don't know if Minecraft would have remained a game. I'm sure there would have, uh, there would have been a grassroots movement of educators who would have created the content on their own. But Microsoft has really t taken advantage of this. So I look forward to what they plan on doing with it later on. Uh, due to the fact that many of us were new, uh, there are quite a few videos in this webinar. Because Minecraft is a paid-for tool, uh, I wouldn't assume that everybody had access to it from the get-go. So I've done my best to curate what I think are some of the best descriptive videos about Minecraft to kind of give us an idea of what it, what it is. Now, this one is a little bit lengthy, but I, I think it's important. It's a young person talking about this mansion that he has built. But he talks about why he put certain things where they are throughout the mansion. And when I think back to the computational thinking, he really has a, justif a justification. He pitches his ideas so well in this video without, uh, you know, I don't know that he, those were her, his intentions. Um, I think our students nowadays with access to the internet are really learning in depth what they are interested in. And this example is one of those cases where this individual is so in love with the Minecraft world that he's created this mansion. And he talks about symmetry. And he talks about textures. And he talks about math. And he talks about spatial awareness without, you know, without knowing that that's what he's talking to. So as you watch this video, and it does have audio, uh, I would like if you could listen to his talk, listen to the math talk and the real world applications. It's very authentic what he's done. Um, I'm going to mute my microphone again and I will see and hear you all, or I guess I won't hear you, you'll hear me in about 15 minutes time. So in about 15 minutes after this, this mansion tour, come back again to this slide and please click the green check mark. Uh, welcome to Daryl and Mary. Uh, yeah, we're just well, just finishing up this YouTube video here. Uh, you can scan it using a mobile device on that QR code that's on the screen, and you know, bookmark it or or watch it now or watch it later on. I'm going to mute my microphone again uh, just until we have a majority of people with the green check mark.
Okay, my video has been finished now for a few minutes. Um, it still shows that we're waiting just a few to uh, finish up the video. Don't forget, if you are finished, could you please hit the green check mark? I don't want to leave anybody behind, and I don't want to also have uh, you know people sitting. So I'm going to try my best to sort of balance that. And I have no idea who Stampy Longhead is, so please explain that one. Oh, he's, okay, a YouTuber. Yes, yes, of course. You know, we were talking about pathways in my grade 8 classroom the other day, and <laughs> YouTuber is now a career opportunity. You know, being a YouTuber is now something that, that our students aspire to do and to be. Okay, just waiting for four more. Oh, and you know what? Two of them are moderators, so they've probably taken off as well. So let's let's move on. Okay, we talked about computational thinking and why that's important for the future. We we looked at Minecraft ever so slightly and saw that it's incredibly engaging. Let's get down to business and let's kind of meet in the middle. I learned a long time ago that it's absolutely impossible to keep up with every piece of technology and app out there. I was wearing myself thin. It was driving me crazy. I thought I had to know everything there is to know about these tools. And I woke up one day and I realized my job is to know the Ontario curriculum through and through that I teach and to recognize it when students are engaging in it. So when I see students building things in Minecraft, it becomes teachable moments because I know my grade 7 and 8 curriculum and I can sit down beside them and I can have those, those conversations about what it is they're doing and what it is I'm actually trying to teach them at the same time. So using the text tool after watching that video, let's just brainstorm some ideas. What curriculum connections did you make to your grade level just watching that video? And if you would like to use the text tool, you can actually jot it right down on the slide. That way it's, it'll be captured in the recording and we'll be able to see it at a later date. So the text tool is right above the image tool that we used early on. I love the idea for settings for novel studies, uh, habitats for social studies as well. Describing locations in French. Lots of wonderful ideas. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is sometimes we have this preconceived notion of play carrying a negative context to it a lot. Um, I remember vividly a few years ago doing some coding things with my students and being questioned from parents and, and you know, colleagues. It, it looks like we're playing all the time and, and I'm not sure when play sort of carried that negative context or when it sort of shifted. I think it's shifting back now. So even if we just were playing on Minecraft for an hour, we would be covering all of the big ideas that you have mentioned here. It's what we then, you know, take with the tool and, and really dive into and dig deeper that allows us to extract, you know, strands in, in, in great breadth. In grade one, uh, it looks like this. I grabbed this from the science curriculum in grade one. Objects have observable characteristics and are made from materials. Materials have specific properties. An object is held together by its structure. The materials and structure of an object determine its purpose, and humans make choices related to the use of objects and materials that have a direct effect on the environment. So a grade one student, even just playing in Minecraft, would be exploring some of that science curriculum um, for that grade. Moving up to grade seven now, so still science and still form and function, 
structures have a purpose. The form of the structure is dependent on its function, and the interactions between structures and forces is predictable. Uh, Susan has posted the link into the curriculum document in the chat box there where you can have a look. Whether you teach science or you don't teach science, it's a great opportunity to be cross-curricular because even, like I said, even just playing in Minecraft um, and having students write about it or explore the math as well, you're, you're really spiraling all of your, not only your strands, but some of the other content areas as well. Uh, the, you know, the medieval feast uh, castle building activities that, that we often see in grade four could be done in a new digital way. So um, grade four students could create castles based on the mid of, mid medieval themes that uh, maybe were assigned to them or they had chosen or, you know, exploring catapults or whatever it is that they might be studying. Just new ways to do lessons that, you know, very engaging and really cool things that we've, we have been doing for quite some time. There's new opportunity to do the, the same uh, stuff that we're used to just in a new way. So just using Minecraft as the new tool to do what we've sort of always done a lot of the times. Um, you know, I, I think back to Teachers College and not reinventing the wheel, right? So here's a great example of using a, a wonderful, engaging, traditional lesson in a new way. I want to move on and talk a little bit about redstone. Redstone is a mineral in the Minecraft world that up until recently was only available on the full version on the computer uh, and due to a recent update is now available on all of the mobile versions. So all versions of, of Minecraft, to my knowledge, now have redstone. And redstone is something that kids have to collect and save. They mine for it. And it allows them to do some really cool things by linking it together. Um, I thought I would try my best to explain it, but I thought it would be even cooler to have a very young student explain what redstone is. So it's a very quick video again. Uh, head over to YouTube, listen to this student's description of what redstone is and how it's incredibly important. Um, I just want to talk about the financial literacy piece of that uh, in here in Ontario. So we'll come back together here in about a minute and a half. You know, videos like this one make me think about my own practice. So here we have a very young um, male student, I'm assuming a male student, who's created a media piece of explanation writing to educate his authentic audience about redstone in Minecraft. And I think about how, you know, I think I reflect on my own teaching practice and how I struggled to engage students to not, not only write explanations, but even create persuasive explanations or opinions through media context and because of the internet now our students are doing it authentically if it's something they're interested in if they have a buy-in to whatever the content or context is they're creating this content on their own without being asked to do that and had this been a student in my class I would have asked them to then bring it into class and I would have used it as a teachable moment to talk about explanation talk about um, media, talk about purpose and audience, and, and that, that's an assessment piece. You know, there's, there's a point in conversation, and, uh, and I can offer him next steps about a video he's created on his own because he wanted to do that because he has his own online following. So even if you just played with redstone, um, I, I noticed the, the rocks and minerals. I hadn't even thought about that, Alex, in grade four, rocks and minerals, of course. Uh, I was immediately thinking about grade six and having students build circuits because when you use when you use redstone, you create circuits that allow you to open and close doors and, and turn off lights and make things happen in the Minecraft world. Um, so it's almost like if you're familiar with the Makey Makey um, in the physical space that's recently come out by MIT or something like that. It's basically a digital version of that. And so even just playing with redstone and making lights turn on, that's teaching the grade six uh, circuits curriculum. 
and and then to you know incorporate that into a math lesson. There's lots of rich opportunities to do some really cool things. So let's talk about the math here. The, the at the core, Minecraft is definitely math. Each block in Minecraft is one cubic meter, and so there's some pros and cons to that. Um, I can have students build things and, and tell me the the volume of the structures they've built, but I also want students to explore proportional relationships, and it, it can become challenging if I want them to recreate, you know, recreate the classroom to scale. That can be a little bit challenging um, without having to round, but maybe the idea of rounding becomes a teachable moment throughout that process, too. I want to talk about a lesson I did last year. Uh, I was giving my students this question. Uh, it was a growing pattern, of course, and it came out of a textbook, and we were going through, and we were going to make a table of values. And we are going to come up with the, the algebraic rule. Now, keep in mind that, again, I teach grades 7 and 8. So you'll notice in this pattern, um, each figure has four blocks added to it. So the pattern rule here is actually 4n plus 1. So in term 1, there's, there's five blocks. In term 2, there's nine. In term 3, there's 13. And so I put this on the board, and I was, I was trying to model you know, the process. I created the table of values with them, and we sort of came up with this pattern rule you know, algebraically. And I had a student at the back of the room just shout out and say, this is incredibly blocky. And I had no idea what he was referring to. And he said, you keep giving us these linear math patterns that seem to only want to grow from left to right. And I said, I, I'm not quite getting to what you're saying. And he said, give me 10 minutes. And he came back with this. And it was one of those, you know, mic drop, mind-blowing kind of moments where he saw this pattern growing out towards him in that third dimension as well as from left to right. And I consider this spatial reasoning and thinking in big pictures and the way he saw that pattern. And so what I love particularly about Minecraft is when I taught patterning in this method, there was sort of one right answer. And, and students had to kind of extend the pattern the way I see the pattern growing. Now I have students creating growing patterns that are unique to them. So I've got these opportunities to naturally scaffold instruction and, and differentiate because the kids are not only creating content, but they're creating content that is completely personal and unique to them. You know, if you have a student on an IEP who's maybe not at grade level, their pattern might be, might be a simple pattern, but they're still building it and they're still explaining to you how it's increasing uh, each time. I said to this student in particular, I said, is there still one purple block each time? You know, so the traditional way had a purple block in the middle. There was always going to be one purple block. And then he provided me with this piece. And I said, is there only one purple block? I really don't know. And he said, no. And he kind of grinned at me. And he said, the purple blocks are also incre increasing each time. And that's something we didn't talk about. Uh, the old way, the flat way, and I thought, wow, this, you know, the, the math talk, it was incredibly rich to have somebody build this, and it was his idea. And I, all, I go back to my, my own pedagogical shift and just allowing him to do this and to explain it to me, and, and me not shutting him down in class when he had this outburst. Obviously, that becomes a point of conversation that there's appropriate ways to, you know, get my attention. But had I shut him down because I thought it was an outburst, I never would have got this. And the truth is, the student in particular, he, he wasn't really going to um, extend patterns like this had I, give it, had I given it to him out of a textbook or in print. Uh, so anyway, these are the three boys. We had a, we had a PA day at school, and the principal said, OK, uh, the staff are talking. Let's get these boys in. So these three boys took my patterning uh, example to a whole nother level. They were <laughs> they were using Wi-Fi hotspots off of phones to beat you know IT firewalls because they were creating a Minecraft server so that they could all share this space and create patterns together from multiple points in the school. The three boys you see pictured here are uh, what we used to call the target kids, the disengaged, generally level two. I hate to blanket students and put them in categories, but just sort of paint that idea um, of, of who these, these students are. And these three boys in particular, who traditionally were not real avid fans of school, 
came in on a PA day to teach our staff not just about Minecraft, but what they had done. And I challenged my staff to write down all of the math they heard in, you know, in these students' explanations. And so I wrote about it. Uh, I won't spend any time right now and force you to read it. If you're interested in, in seeing what they actually came up with, then grab that QR code or come back tomorrow after this is, is posted, and you can certainly have a see at what they had done in greater detail. But I just love sharing this story because it was just a huge moment and a, and a really important reflection piece for me in my own teaching pedagogies to engage these students by allowing them the, the choice and the voice to do something a little bit differently. I do want to draw your attention to the spatial reasoning document now um, that we have access to. There's a lot of research supporting spatial reasoning and being able to think in, in big pictures. And I, I guess I, I kind of describe spatial reasoning as one's ability to predict a game of chess, you know, two or three moves ahead and multiple scenarios. Being able to recognize chess pieces in relation to um, other pieces, you know, in proximity on the, uh, on the chess board itself. So if you want to scan that QR code there and, and grab the document, you can read through the document at, at a later time. But I just want to talk quickly about some of the big ideas from the document. Spatial thinking involves three components, concepts of space, tools of representation, and processes of reasoning. It involves understanding relationships within and between spatial structures and through a wide variety of possible representations from drawings to computer models. It involves a means to communicate about them. When a child rotates a rectangular prism to fit into a castle she is building at a block center, she is employing spatial reasoning as is the student who uses a diagram of a rectangle to prove that the formula for finding the area of a triangle is one half um, based on type. So uh, there's a lot of value into, into what we're doing here with Minecraft. You know, we're playing on Minecraft. We're also doing science. We're exploring spatial reasoning. We're, we're engaging in computational thinking. And we're just definitely doing math. And so being able to take all of these ideas and, and then focus on a Minecraft project is incredibly rich, and specifically a Minecraft um, project in a content area like, say, history or, or say, science. I want to tell a story about um, a, a kid dear to my heart. He's in grade nine now. Uh, Connell Christensen was a student that came to me last year with autism, and he was nonverbal. And you know, his older brother also has autism, and so. His dad came to me, Connell's dad came to me early in the year last year and said, okay, um, we've already sent one to secondary. Um, what can we do for Connell in his grade 8 year to maybe unlock something? Um, Connell is nonverbal, and, and, you know, if you looked at Connell's report card traditionally, based on a compliant environment, Connell is not a good student. Uh, he, he doesn't show initiative. He doesn't, he's not very organized when it comes to academics and things like that. But if you look at Connell in a different light, you know, if you look at Connell and, and really focus on what he is interested in, and, and keep in mind the autism piece, he was organized and he did demonstrate initiative, but it had to be something relative and authentic to Connell's world. So when Dad came to me a year ago and said, he sat us down in the office. Um, I was there, and the resource teacher was there, and the principal was there. And he stood up, and he held out a piece of paper. And he said, I have a dream. I have a dream that Connell will be a functioning member of society. I'm getting teary-eyed now just thinking about it. There's not a dry eye in the room, of course. He says, I have a dream that someday Connell will be able to hold down a job and support himself. Until we rethink Connell's program at school, I'm afraid that's not going to happen. Because Connell is autistic, I am going to challenge you to focus solely on Connell's strengths and sort of put his weaknesses to his side within reason. Because if he is going to be successful in life, it's going to be based on something he's interested in. As you are all aware, and of course this is Dad saying this to our staff, as you are all aware, if Connell doesn't want to do something, Connell is not going to do it. And it, it becomes this, this behavioral um, moment, and Connell ends up getting into trouble. So long story short, I noticed that Connell had a, a big, big, big interest in Minecraft. And so I've, I've got an arrow there on the slide pointing to a flat pattern out of the textbook, and I just I showed it to Connell, and I said, Connell, can you build this? 
And if you would just spend a minute watching this video, he doesn't say a word, but he doesn't have to. He is able to communicate his mathematical thinking um, in this video. And, and for the first time, his parents like just saw this opportunity for him to to demonstrate his mathematical ability. I mean, he his CAT score, he, he scored the highest on the CAT test of all the grade 8 students that we had tested, right? So the autism was a significant barrier to his ability to communicate. So I'm just going to let you watch that. It would mean a lot to me and a lot to Connell's parents uh, if you watch that video. So please, green check mark when you're finished. Okay, um, so back in my homeroom class, um, we thought we, we're not going to stop there. We, we need to keep rolling with this. What can we do? So I challenged them to create a game in Minecraft. Uh, I was also the science teacher, so we were looking at structures. Our school is a year one, year two, so all of our intermediates were doing the, the structures a year. And I said, let's build something really cool. It can be a castle with ten floors. Each floor can have a pattern. Uh, the next floor has to have a pattern that's a little bit more difficult than the previous one. Maybe you want to build ten different castles where there's only one room in each castle. But each room is going to house some sort of growing pattern. You're going to have to explain the pattern. You're going to have to give clues uh, and put signs in this Minecraft world and build something unique. And then you're going to present it. So this, this was actually their idea, not mine. So we built this whole, this whole... Um, project around these curriculum expectations. So the top two big ideas in science, of course the bottom three are the math expectations for grade seven and eight. I, I won't let you watch this video because I talk too much and we're running out of time, but hopefully on the recording you can come back and look. This was a student in my class with a learning disability. She has an IEP and she created a very simple pattern in a castle, um, but she was so proud of it. She had something tangible, something concrete that she was able to produce. And so it, it was such, it's such inspirational and, and makes me really think now about assessment and evaluation because now I've got tangible, concrete evidence from a student on a regular program who's only accommodated. And how am I to evaluate her? How do I, assessment's easy. I can give her next steps. I can encourage her to, to keep moving. But when it comes to evaluating her, how do I evaluate her on a grade standard, you know, when she's created this really unique piece of art? So that's something I'm working on in my practice, and I would love it if you would reach out to me and sort of guide me on that journey. How do we, we're, we're personalizing learning. How do we personalize evaluation? Um, I had one student take this project and hide the patterns throughout this massive world, and then she turned it into a narrative story where you had to solve riddles to find the next pattern. And when you found the pattern, you had to solve the pattern rule in order to get the next clue in order to find the next pattern, and it continued forever. And I thought, how incredibly rich is this? And when I think about computational thinking again, she created something really cool and unique to her own um, strengths and needs and what she needed to get out of this project rather than the, the one-size-fits-all um, model. Just this week, we did an EduGains uh, lesson with my grade 7 students about surface area. So uh, again, I won't spend a lot of detail on this because I want to show you some really cool Minecraft resources that you can take back. But basically, students had to rearrange 24 cubic meter blocks on a flatbed truck and come up with the most efficient um, load, the most efficient cargo load in terms of surface area, and then they had to pitch it to the rest of the class. So it had to be a little bit persuasive. So why, what made it the, the best way to load the cargo? So our goal here was to teach that the volume wasn't changing. It was always going to be 24 cubic meters, but there's different ways you can orient that, orientate that, and so the, the surface area will change. We had some students use uh, linking cubes we had some students draw it. We gave them the choice. You must demonstrate this as best as you see fit. Now, uh, my current students, sort of the same profile as the ones I was talking about before, 
they built the trucks in Minecraft. So not only did they have to actually build the, the volume, uh, sorry, the, the, the cargo piece of it, but they were building the trucks as well, and, and they weren't duplicating them. They were building them again, you know, from scratch and creating this tangible piece of evidence. Um, this one in particular, this student, uh, he must have spent an hour building these four trucks, and he came back and he said, okay, um, I know that the volume is 24 cubic meters on the cargo load at the back. I have no idea what the surface area is because it took me so long to build it. But there was the buy-in for him. You know, he was engaged in the process of, of exploring this. He didn't know what the surface area was, but he knew it was different in each case, and he knew the volume was constant. And that was kind of the big idea of the lesson. I mean, we really wanted them to find the surface area as well, but our goal here was to understand that surface area can change while volume remains constant. I've had students in the past um, build things in Minecraft to scale, talking about proportional relationships. That might be another example of something you want to do. Our, our art teacher took student art, they digitized it, and then they pixelated it, then they rebuilt it in Minecraft, which was incredibly powerful. I think if you are going to go back to your school and incorporate Minecraft, the, the product of what students create in Minecraft is certainly important, but the process certainly outweighs that in terms of significance. I think if you're going to use the product that students come up with in the Minecraft world as a, an evaluative, evaluative piece, then certainly assess the process and, and look at the learning skills and look at how well they collaborate and things like that. Um, I have students who are using the same map throughout the year, so if they're building patterns um, and then they're adding, you know, other things to it, it's kind of becoming a portfolio. I didn't envision this. I just noticed that students were using the same maps because they knew that it was sort of their, their math map and that Minecraft has become kind of a binder for them for a lot of our, our math things, which I think is really important. If you do any research or if you've read Seymour Papert's research about computational thinking, he talks about math land as being this place where students are immersed in numbers and immersed in mathematics. And he makes reference to the fact that people growing up in France know French. And so if we immerse our students in math land, then they will construct their own knowledge of mathematics. And I think that Minecraft is a perfect opportunity to certainly support the research that Papert had 20 or 30 years ago. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have time for this. Jim Pedrick is uh, a Twitter friend from afar who I've never met in person, but I've known for a number of years. He actually had his high school students build uh, their high school and they edited the textures so that the grade 8 students at the feeder schools felt more comfortable when they came. Now, word of warning, we, you know, Safe Schools Act, act you want to be very careful about building your school based on a blueprint. Um, so he built parts of the school and created a scavenger hunt for his feeder schools. And so as a grade 8 student, you would take a virtual tour of the high school. You might have to go to the cafeteria to find a clue. Um, I thought this would be a really cool way to almost go find where your locker is in proximity in the middle of August before you start school in September. Really cool things that I never even thought of. Uh, he was using it for his English program while engaging the feeder schools. So uh, great idea. Just like I said, uh, make sure that you follow all the rules and regulations in terms of safe school acts and you know, building maps of your school um, to scale and putting them out there onto the internet. A design challenge. So I'm sure you've probably all got some ideas now. Um, we're only about 10 minutes away to the conclusion. So just quickly, uh, throw something out there. I love running through this slide deck because I always learn something new. Um, I know my curriculum incredibly well, and I'm, I'm learning the other curricular areas. So anything that you might have that you could throw at me right now, what, what's, your, what's your one takeaway right now? Or, what do you plan on doing with Minecraft when you come back? So use the text tool, maybe just about 30 seconds. Um, a friend of mine is a history teacher, and um, so where we live here in Chatham, we have the Thames River, and so students are rebuilding Thames River. So they can actually go back and explore what the War of 1812 might have looked like. 
and patterning for sure. Um, patterning, uh, again, what I love about Minecraft is you're, you're teaching patterning, but you're doing all of those other things we talked about earlier on while focusing just on the, the specific patterning expectation that you might be teaching. Story starters for disengaged writers. I love it. I love the idea of building, build the setting. You know, what does this look like? Are we in the desert? Are we, are we in, you know, the neighborhood? Are we at the park? What does it look like? Build a green energy efficient building, grade five and six. Love it. If you're familiar with Zoe Brangham Pipe's work out of uh, Hamilton Wentworth, she had students actually build structures for a plot of land that existed in their neighborhood and they went and pitched it to the municipality and they actually voted on the structures and went out and built them. So students actually um, designed and, and developed these things in the Minecraft world and then pitched it to, to the township and the township turned their ideas into authentic structures that now exist in the park. Create an event or structure for Carnival. Yes, great idea, great idea. OK, I'm going to advance the slide again. Um, these ideas will remain, like I said. So when you come back and watch the recording later, they will be there. So how do I get this thing? Pocket Edition. I had to edit my slide yesterday. A week and a half ago, the Pocket Edition was $8. Now it's $9.99 on iOS. But it's there. So we have Pocket Edition on the iPad. We have Pocket Edition on Android. And we have Pocket Edition on uh, Windows tablets. And due to the recent update, they all have red stones. So there are some limitations to the Pocket Edition that I will talk about briefly. But everything that I have shown you tonight can be done on these tablets. Uh, my classroom has iPads, so we predominantly use Pocket Edition on iOS. If you're interested in getting it on Mac or PC, it's about $27 and it's available at this link. It does require an installation. Um, so I, I don't know, you know what it looks like at your school if you have to bug an IT person to have that done, but it does require an installation. Uh, but it's available there. I want to talk briefly about Minecraft server. There is a Minecraft server so students and teachers alike can create stuff on the same canvas. And it, you know, it sounds like a great idea, and it really is a great idea, and you, you, you can do some really cool things, and there's educators out there that are doing some really cool things. But there's a level of responsibility with that. Who's responsible for the behavior that takes place in that world after hours if you, the teacher, have created it? Now, you can shut it down as the teacher. You can turn off the server. Um, so you can go on. You can build something. You can turn the server on, off, sorry and then that might be your lesson the next morning. So something you've prepared on a shared canvas that all your kids can actually access uh, and get on. Um, I've heard stories, you know, the, the bullying stories of other kids breaking other kids' structures. And so it, just, just word of caution, there's a lot of really rich things you can do collaboratively, but there is that added level of, of digital citizenship sh that we should also talk about there too. Uh, Robin, can more than one person play? So on the server edition, you can have multiple people on the same Minecraft canvas, on the same map, essentially playing together in the same world. They can see each other as well. So you can have students actually build one structure collaboratively on that shared space. But that's on the um, PC and the um, sorry, the Mac version. There is a server on the Pocket Edition, but it's a little bit more limited in, in terms of what you can actually do. In my experience, it's been seamless and easy for me to have students create stuff on their own device or they're sharing a tablet um, in the physical space. It's, it's just a little bit more manageable for me at this point in time with where I am. Minecraft EDU, phenomenal. This is brand spanking new. Microsoft has put this out. You can hit minecraftedu.com. You can search by class. You can search by age group. You can search by specific topics. And they have created a community of Minecraft educators so that you don't have to recreate the wheel. If you want to go on and find a map about a specific topic, odds are somebody has created it. 
um, and it's on there. Now, obviously, there's there's fewer resources because it is so new, but it's going to blow up, it's going to grow, and this thing is going to be absolutely massive. So certainly check it out. We've got about seven minutes left. Um, explore it, click on your grade level, see what's there. Kids can download maps from there. Um, so a lot of the, the groundwork is already done in so very, very, very many ways. On that note, I'm going to say thank you so very much for listening to me, uh, as well as my dog who keeps staring at me because he has no idea what's going on. Um, if you have any questions, shoot me an email, shoot me a tweet, shoot me, you know, however you want to get a hold of me, I'm available on multiple platforms. I'll happily uh, do my best to help. If not, I'll certainly find somebody who knows a heck of a lot more about Minecraft than I do. That was just fantastic, Brian. Thank you so, so much. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the feedback survey. Um, you can get the link. This link on this whiteboard is actually active. I'm, actu I'm going to put it also in the chat. And also, as Syria mentioned at the outset, when you close out of Blackboard Collaborate, it's now a built-in um, you'll get a link immediately afterwards. It will open in your browser. So there's plenty of ways to get the feedback survey um, to you. It doesn't take very long. And I think Siri mentioned it's really important that we do it. It provides feedback. It provides information about, about uh, sessions that are popular. But it also generates funding uh, through for OTF for this program. So it's really important that you do it. So thank you so much, Brian. And that was just awesome. There's also uh, coming up OTF sessions. The link on the uh, on this page right here is also showing you. Um, it's an active link, and it will take you to the OTF Connects calendar, so you're able to see what's coming up. On the next slide, I've just put a summary of uh, next week and the following week, and some of the sessions that are coming. You can see that Brian's doing another one with Scratch, talking about storytelling and coding, coming up uh, a week on Monday, and uh, some other great sessions. Uh, we're, we're really excited, I think. <laughs> there you go, shameless plug for February the 8th. I think there's high registration for that one as well. So um, thank you very much. I believe that Syria also mentioned at the beginning that they have just received confirmation of funding. Syria, you can jump in if you want me not to do this, but uh, this is just new news this week. And uh, you're, this is kind of exciting news for folks that may be interested in taking math AQs or ABQs. Um, in specific areas. So I am going to go ahead and, Siri, are you going to jump in here? Okay, perfect. Uh, then I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop the recording. Oh, yeah, please stop. Sorry, Siri. I would just love to say uh, thank you to Brian. It was, a, again, another very, very rich session. And um, I love the way you, you provide so many curriculum connections. Uh, to really engage students and how you use Minecraft to uh, to bring out the best from students with a wide range of abilities. So uh, thank you, Brian, for sharing so many um, rich examples um, and creative ideas. Um, um, and I'd like to thank everyone here for giving up their time um, to join us tonight. Um, in terms of uh, that last slide, we'll just hold on to that for a bit. Um, and okay. um, we're, we're looking forward to upcoming and new sessions. So thank you all, and uh, have a good evening. Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording now. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much.